All right, everybody, we are live on the YouTubes. Stoneman Smith Jr. here with The Unapologetic Apologist, and I'm super excited for today's episode. Josh Rasmussen is a friend of the show. He's back again, and for the first time, I'm very uh, glad to have the chance to meet him and speak with him. Dr. Alex Malpass, thank you both for being here. Hi. Thank you for having us. Yeah, so uh, Josh has been on the show a bunch. Uh, the audience, I'm sure, is familiar with him, but Dr. Al Alex Malpass, just in case people are not familiar with, your, with you yet, where can people uh, find you and find your work? Um, I don't, well, I'm, I always find it a bit awkward promoting my own work or whatever. I, um, I do have a blog, although I don't, I haven't written on that for a while. Um, and, um, I do a podcast very infrequently when I, when I, um, feel like I want to talk to somebody in particular, uh, called Thoughtology. Um, so yeah, I guess, and then I, you can find my published papers on my Phil Papers profile. Um, okay. Yeah. And where can people find the podcast? Is that on YouTube or a different medium? Yeah, that's on YouTube. Okay, it's cool. So I'll, I'll get the link to your YouTube channel and put it in the description. Uh, Dr. Josh Rasmussen's YouTube channel is in the description, Worldview Design for everybody. Uh, so yeah, without taking too much time to jump right in, we're going to be discussing two things today. First is the Grim Reaper paradox, whether or not it's sound. Is that actually semantically correct to ask if a paradox is sound? That's what I was wondering. When I was posting well, this. is the argument sound maybe from the paradox? We could put it that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. And then the second thing we'll be discussing is the problem of evil. Dr. Alex Malpass has discussed that with Michael Brown and Randall Rouser. I believe both of those were on Modern Day Debate. So I'll actually add links to the description where you guys can check both those conversations out. Um, I definitely have a better grasp on that one than the Grimber Paradox. And so I'm really interested to listen to the first part of this discussion because I don't necessarily have a dog in, in the fight on this one. Um, so yeah, Josh, you said you would be happy to lay it out and then, and then we'll just discuss it because Dr. Alex Malpass has published a paper on it today. Yeah, so, uh, or submit, he submitted a paper. Submitted a paper. Uh, submitted a paper. It will be published. It's a good paper. It will be published. <laughs> yeah, so uh, last week or so, Alex said, you know, can we talk about the Grim Reaper paradox? And uh, then I looked at his paper, and then I began to have this itch to, to have this conversation. Uh, you know, I actually don't have a dog in this fight either. I was kind of teasing that if, in the end, Alex persuades me that the, that the, that the argument doesn't provide a reason to think that there's a, a finite past, then we should call this a debate. And then we should say, look, in this debate, uh, somebody changed their mind in the middle of the debate, you know, because I think that would be really cool. Um, but the, the argument is pretty interesting. I have a little bit of a story about how it sort of affected my thinking. And this is part of why I am itching to talk about this with, with Alex, because Alex's paper argues for a conclusion that contradicts how things currently seem to me. So I'm, I'm very curious here. So, so for many years, I heard these arguments for a finite past. And these arguments you could think of as um, uh, parts of larger arguments for more interesting conclusions, like that maybe there was a, a cause of the beginning of the universe, right? There's the Kalam cosmological argument. But these arguments for a finite past, I never really found them particularly persuasive. Then one day in graduate school, I went on to this blog called the Prost Blogion, which doesn't exist anymore. And Alexander Proust had this interesting little Grim Reapers argument for a finite past. And I was skeptical at first. I read his argument, I was skeptical. But as I, I thought it through, it began to appeal to me. And it, was, it became the first argument that gave me a reason to think, okay, well, I think probably the past is, is finite. Now, I don't really have a big dog in this fight. I mean, if the past is not finite, it doesn't really fundamentally change many of my, my views about sort of fundamental reality. Um, I've sort of left open the length of time in many of my own arguments, for example. But, um, but because this is an argument that has given me a reason to think the past is finite, and because Alex has a nice little paper where he argues that this doesn't provide a good reason to think that the past is finite, this, this does make me very curious to kind of talk this out. And my goal, I was thinking before our time together, like, what's my, what's my goal? What do I want to accomplish? And I think really what I want to accomplish is just to see if we can get things clearer together. Um, that's my goal. So here's the argument. Here's a way of setting it up. There's different versions of the argument. But um, you can sort of basically set up a weird puzzle uh, where the structure of the argument goes like this. Um, if it's possible for there to be an infinite 
causal series going out into the past, then it's possible to set up a paradoxical scenario involving Grim Reapers, which I'll describe in a moment. Um, but it's not possible to set up this paradoxical scenario. Therefore, it's not possible for there to be this infinite causal chain into the past. Okay, so what is this scenario? Well, here's one way you might set it up. So imagine that there's been an infinite past and imagine that there have been events producing things. And so let's imagine that among the events are the productions of clocks. Okay, I've got a clock behind me here to illustrate this. And let's say that there are these clocks that are installed into these uh, things. We can call them Grim Reapers because they are things that have the power to destroy and kill somebody whom we'll call Fred. All right. Let's say Bob wants Fred dead. And so Bob has come up with this infinite sequence of events. Uh, well, Bob has always been operating with this plan from all of eternity to kill Fred. And alas, the time has come when everything has been set up. And Bob is going to kill Fred at midnight. And here's how the setup works. One of the Grim Reapers is set to kill Fred at midnight if Fred is still alive and wasn't already killed. Okay. So his clock is set at midnight. And so that what that means is that when midnight comes, the this Grim Reaper will check. Is he alive? If he is, he gets killed. Then there's another Grim Reaper that was produced and set up to kill Fred at 11.30. His clock is set to 11.30. And um, so he checks, is he dead? If he's, if he's already dead, well, then there, there's nothing left to do. But if he's not, then he'll kill him right there at 11.30. There's another Grim Reaper set at uh, 11.15, another one at 11.07 and 30 seconds. And you keep setting it up so that each one is set up at half the interval of time uh, distant from the one before. So you can set up an infinite number of Grim Reapers all set to kill Fred within the time interval between uh, 11 p.m. and midnight. Now there's no first Grim Reaper because as you go back through the series, you keep cutting in half the time. So you've got you know one set at three minutes, one set at one minute, uh, three minutes past 11, uh, one and a half minutes past 11, and so on all the way back so that there's no first Grim Reaper. Now, what's weird about it is that once this is set up, it seems like Fred should be dead by midnight. But then if you ask like, well, which Grim Reaper killed Fred? Well, it can't be the one set at 1130 because he should have already been dead by 1130 because all the other, in there were infinitely many other ones already set to kill him. And for every single one, you can make the same argument for every Grim Reaper set to kill Fred. He can't be the one who killed Fred because there are already infinitely many ones who would have already killed him. And so it looks like there's no Grim Reaper that kills Fred. And yet in this scenario, uh, Fred is dead. And he, he dies at the hand of something. I mean, how did he die? Uh, there's a way of setting this up so you, you basically get a contradiction that Fred is dead by the hand of a Grim Reaper. But there is no Grim Reaper that killed him. So he's dead, he's not dead. Or he's killed, he's not killed. And that's a contradiction. And the contradiction, I take that as, as sort of a way of seeing that this scenario, it's one way of seeing that this scenario is impossible. Um, now, like I said, when I first saw this argument, so again, the structure of the argument is if there could be this infinite past, then there could be this impossible scenario. But there can't be this impossible scenario, so there can't be an infinite past. When I, when I first encountered this argument, I, it didn't persuade me um, because it seemed like, well, I want you know, why think that if the past is infinite, that would be definitely possible to make this scenario? Uh, maybe the past could be infinite, but it wouldn't thereby be possible to make this scenario. But I think what, what sort of got my mind, and Alex, it'll be interesting to see what you think about this, what sort of turned my mind on this is when I started thinking about uh, sort of what would make it, what, what would prevent this scenario from being set up so like, here's another way of thinking about it. Imagine that the clocks are randomized. So instead of Bob explicitly saying, okay, I'm gonna set this clock at this time, this clock at this time, this clock at this time, each time is just, it's gonna randomly be set. So each Grim Reaper will randomly shoot 
Uh, it seems like if there could be an infinite pass, there could be this infinite sequence of events where all these clocks are set up and they're randomized. Uh, it seems like by a kind of modal independence that the what one that the setting of one clock won't affect the setting of the other clocks. So if one clock sort of randomly gets set to eleven thirty, that's not going to like force other clocks to be set at different times because th their intrinsic properties are not affected by the clock set of any particular Grim Reaper. And then if that's right, well then it seems well then it straightly follows that. Uh, the Grim Reaper scenario would be able to be possible because it could just be random that all the clocks just happen to be randomly set to form the Grim Reaper scenario. And what's to stop that? Uh, it seems like it, it. we know it can't happen because of the. it would be a contradiction, but it just sort of seems intuitive to me that it would be possible were an infinite past possible. And so I get that that would be the argument. That would be a way of setting up the argument. So you're welcome to clarify that or um, add to that or correct that, whatever way. I mean, you're really close in the weeds on this argument, having worked on that paper. Yeah, OK. So <clears throat> um, there's so let's just be clear then that one way out of this. Well, there's this paradoxical situation like you described, like if you've got in a, a sequence that has no beginning um, and it's set up so that there's a condition that holds for each one if and only if it doesn't hold on any of the previous ones then then you've got a contradiction right but if you have both of those two features present in any setup and so you could be uh, Grim Reapers with clocks or uh, it doesn't really matter about the detail. It could just be a machine that prints out today's date if none of the mm. previous ones have or whatever. It could be anything, really. So long as yeah. those two conditions hold, it seems to me that's all that really matters. So thinking about it in this most abstract sense, that's that's the setup. And um, I think the pull of the intuition that you're describing is, um, well, each of those two conditions seem independently, um, well, What's the pull? It's the idea is that if there was a beginningless sequence, then it could have that condition satisfied. So there's something that prints out today's date if none of the previous ones have done or something. It just feels like um, if there was a beginningless sequence, then it could things could be arranged in that way. And you bolster right. that intuition by saying, look, if there was a beginningless sequence, things could be set up in a slightly different way. Um, and we should consider those two possibilities so nearby it is impossible yeah. to suppose one is possible, but the other is impossible. If I may just clarify one thing here, just to sort of set up that condition. I mean, let's imagine that the Grim Reapers are labeled with numbers. So like one, two, three, all the way out. And um, imagine that one's the, the condition for number one is that it will only kill if two hasn't killed. Yeah. And the condition for two is that it will only kill if three hasn't killed. Um, now that actually doesn't lead to a contradiction Mm -hmm. unless their clocks randomly come to a certain sequence. And I guess that's the weird part. It's like, what's the stop? I mean, if the clocks are just set to randomly be set, it's like, why should the set of one clock forbid the other clocks from being randomly yeah. set in a certain arrangement? That That's where my mind just like, it's like, no, like that, th these are independent. They're modally independent. Each clock should just randomly able to come to its own place, um, in which case then you can get a violation of those conditions, uh, which of course you can't. So, right. yeah. so, that, so that's why that, I, I work it back. Yeah, go ahead. Sometimes that um, is put as a, a claim that there must be a mysterious force, which yeah. accounts for why that one setup can't obtain, even though the beginning of the sequence is there and you feel like, I could just fill all the places on that sequence, you know, and if I did, then then there'd be some input. So so the the idea is unless there's some kind of time lord which is preventing contradictions from appearing, uh, there's there's no there's no reason to suppose that that thing wouldn't appear. Um, <clears throat> and then what the and it seems to me what what goes on then is you say, look, what we have to do is make make it that that can't arise, right? That that um, as long if we forbid any backwards infinite sequences then we're all good, right? If every sequence, um, backwards sequence has a first member, 
then mm-hmm. you know is it the first alarm to ring then that reaper kills fred all of the others wake up realize fred's already dead and go back to sleep or whatever there's no paradox there so as long yeah. as there's a first um element to any of these sequences and if they're causal then it's a first cause or something um then we're all good right so that's the thought is that um causal finitism is the thesis that every causal sequence has a um only finitely many uh causes so there's always a first cause to every causal sequence um and if that thesis were true then these paradoxes would never arise because one of the two conditions is that you have this kind of backwards infinite sequence and if they're just impossible on their own then so is the combination of that with any condition it doesn't matter and that condition you know p is true if and only if it's never been true before that's perfectly well satisfiable if there is a beginning right um it's only it, it only uh, rises this paradox um when uh-huh. it's combined with the beginningless sequence so it's they're like two school children where on their own they might be perfectly well behaved but when you put them together uh all hell breaks loose and the mm-hmm. causal finitist is saying the thing to do is to blame one of those children in particular now the viewer that i favor basically says that each of those children should basically is basically innocent on their own and it's only their combination that should be blamed right i don't actually think one of them is the naughty one that needs to be blamed um <clears throat> so i'm not saying that the the past is infinite and i'm not saying causal finitism is false um i'm just saying that the best way to diagnose mm-hmm. well what i suppose what i'm saying is that there are other ways of diagnosing what's going wrong with the benedetti paradox this grim reaper paradox um and the view <clears throat> that i like is um put forward by nicholas shackle in 2005 he has this paper where he outlines this thing called the unsatisfiable pair diagnosis and he's really just saying look there are these two conditions which i just described and they can't be jointly satisfied <clears throat> it's basically logically impossible for them to be jointly satisfied so that's why they they never obtain because it's logically impossible you don't need a further explanation for why that doesn't obtain if it's logically impossible that's enough to say that it can never happen um <clears throat> and he thinks that what's going on is that most of the time when people are describing the setup they don't just say condition a obtains and condition b obtains um they they wrap up the story so that you can't tell that at least one of those conditions is being blatantly committed to and it doesn't seem like you're actually committed to it so I'm surreptitious commitment um and so he thinks you can diagnose and dispel the problem by just showing where the person actually just does commit to that or something logically equivalent to to one of those or both of those conditions and that's all you need to do your your job is done at that point <clears throat> and I actually think that's right i mean what i would need to do i suppose but, but, so i i could talk about this for a long time so i'll try to be quick but one of the things is that we're t- talking about two theories that have um basically equal explanatory power in the sense that with respect to di- you know, killing the benedetti paradoxes they both do the same thing i mean it's not like there are some types of benedetti paradox that you can't kill with a you know suitably phrased version of causal finitism mm-hmm. which probably should be called dependency finitism to make it mm-hmm. to involve semantic paradoxes too um so long as you do that the two things are equally good at killing off these paradoxes so then we, it seems to me the way right way to look at it is what are the ontological commitments of the two theories and then when you look at it <clears throat> like that the ontological commitments to this unsatisfiable pair diagnosis is really not very much at all right? it's just a diagnosis of you know two things are formally um inconsistent with one another so we're talking about you know the commitments of classical logic is about all you need cause of finitism on the other hand says lots of very substantive things about sort of the nature of space and time which um all else being equal you'd rather not have to commit to um if if you don't need to right if if it doesn't if there's no extra explanatory benefit any theoretical utility to postulating a bunch more stuff about the world alchem's razor says not to do that right take the um the lighter ontologically lighter explanation if you can so then uh, that view just seems like normal level headed sensible thing if and proust is quite clear about that too that a conservative theory that is one that doesn't have any ontological commitments is preferable mm-hmm. to one that, that has ontological commitments wiggles mm-hmm. a metaphysical theory and i agree with him about that 
he just thinks that, well, the problem with the, the view that I'm advocating is this mysterious force um, objection. Yeah. Which, if true, if like salient or whatever, would tilt the balance in favor of causal, fi causal finitism because, sure, it commits you to some metaphysical theses, right? But they're not like massively implausible on their face, right? They might be true. Whereas, if my view required a time lord to be preventing certain arrangements of clocks from ever occurring, that's really weird, super like unlikely. And if that was a consequence of his view, I would give up the view because it would be much more ontologically weighty than causal finitism, right? But I don't think that that um, is the right way to look at it. So here's an analogy which um, to push, to hit the ball back over the net, right? To see what you think about this. So um, <clears throat> you might think, so there's this German town, Prussian town, Königsberg, which has a river running through it. And there are seven bridges over that river. And you might think to yourself that what you could do is go for a walk one day and cross each of the seven bridges over the river once without crossing back over one of the bridges you've already crossed. And you might just think you could do that, of course, and have, maybe you have an intuition that you could do that or whatever. But um, you know, you'll find that no matter what you do, you're not going to succeed in that um, endeavor. And um, the mathematician Euler sort of proved by founding graph theory as kind of foundational mm -hmm. proof that such a, such a, a circuit around something with that topology is just inconsistent it's, you couldn't do it right it's like a mathematical proof of the impossibility of doing that um so it would be weird if someone said you know i can cross bridge you know towns with six bridges crossing the river and towns with eight bridges crossing the river how come i can't cross it if it's got seven bridges ah, ah a mysterious force must be at work right that's uh -huh. super implausible um but euler's proof doesn't come with a an implausible assumption of someone keeping people off bridges or whatever that's just not how it works at all it, on an individual instance what would happen if somebody did try and cross the bridges is uh, i don't know what would happen they might fall off a bridge or get bored and slip on a banana skin take your pick out of consistent non-successful scenarios but they're not going to do it they're not going to succeed um and it's not my job to say what would happen right and that's what it seems to me it's a bit like when you say well well you know they could set their clocks this way and you know what's to stop them setting their clock such that the impossible situation obtains i mean i don't think anything's stopping them doing i just think that they're not going to do it why are they not going to do it because it's logically impossible to do that now it's just like crossing all the seven bridges without doubling back on yourself do you think i need to tell you why you can't do that other than showing you that it's like committing to more than it's committing to an inconsistent set of propositions to suppose that you could, right? Do you, or I mean, do, do you see what I'm trying to say here with the? Yeah, yeah, no, I do, and, and and you draw this out in the paper in a very nice way. I mean, I think your paper advances the dialectic because what you're doing is you're considering, okay, what's the best way to sort of kill off the paradox? So one way is causal finitism. Another way is the way that you're proposing where you're finding a certain kind of contradiction and you're saying, well, it's this kind of contradiction. Well, any kind of contradiction, but in these paradoxes, the contradiction takes this form. We mm -hmm. can detect the same form across many paradoxes. So it would be maybe cleaner to just kill off the paradox by forbidding any scenario that results in this form. Now it's interesting because I was thinking about, again, the structure of this. And I, I was curious to ask, so I've, I've got two, two questions for you. Um, the first question is sort of how this reasoning applies in arguments against time travel, to, mm -hmm. because there's a similar structure of an argument. Um, if I could go back in time, then I could grab a gun, go find my dad, my mom, yeah. and, you know, heaven forbid, you know, I could, I could kill them. There's not this sort of like logic fairy that says, wait, wait, don't do that. Because if you do that, then it'll be true that you were never born, in which case it's true. <laughs> Mm -hmm. that you didn't go back in time and that you did go back in time to prevent your, your birth. So, so don't do that because otherwise that'll make a contradiction. And it's like, well, yeah, I mean, the contradiction does reveal that that's not possible, but unless I have some independent reason to think that I actually could go back in time, I'm inclined to take the impossibility of the scenario as evidence for other adjacent uh, impossibilities in particular, going back in time. 
Uh, so mm -hmm. same thing with the bridge case. It's like in the bridge case, if I have a proof that I couldn't cross those bridges in that way, and I have no independent reason to think that I could. I mean, even if I had this kind of modal intuition, like, oh, I can cross six bridges, I can cross seven, I can cross eight. Well, as soon as I see the proof that that leads to a contradiction, then that's enough for me to say, oh, okay, I can't do that. But in the case of, of the infinite past, it seems to me what I would need, and this is where my question comes in, um, why wouldn't I then need some independent argument that uh, not only is this Grim Reaper scenario impossible, but it is possible for there to be an infinite past? Because, okay, so so look, it, what, I, what I'm trying to say is I, I, I can't go back in time and kill my parents if that causes a contradiction. Mm -hmm. We can't set up this Grim Reaper scenario if that causes a contradiction. But if I could go back in time, then it seems to me by this sort of independently plausible principle that nothing's to prevent me from killing my parents, then I could do this impossible thing. It, it's maybe the simplest way to put it is the structure of the argument is uh, if P is possible, then Q is possible. Q is impossible, therefore P is impossible. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. think that our dispute here is over that first premise. Why well, I think mm -hmm. that if P is possible, whether possible whether P is going back in time or P is uh, an infinite past, okay? If P is an infinite past, then the Q in question is setting up the Grim Reaper paradox. If the P is going back in time, then the Q in question is killing my parents. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so okay. we already established that Q is impossible. We agree that's impossible. In the bridge case, I don't see that I'm having the same structure of reasoning. It doesn't seem like in the bridge case, I have some candidate. If P is possible, then I could cross the bridges. Um, therefore, I can cross, cross the bridges, but I, but I can't cross those bridges. Therefore, P is not. It, it doesn't seem like I'm, I'm not seeing that same structure and so I'm well, wondering, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, what I do you mean, think about this? So it seems to me, I'm not quite sure what, so in the, let's call it the like normal Grim Reaper scenario where they all set their alarm clocks and it just happens that they, the infinite number of Reapers set the alarm clocks in a in a, um, a sequence that converges on 11 o'clock, right, with yeah. no first member waking up. For each one, one of someone else wakes up earlier than that one. Um, and then you're saying, well, look, here's a nearby scenario mm -hmm. where they set their alarm clocks that converge on 12 o'clock in the other, in the other direction. So there is an earliest one. He wakes up at half 11 and then the next one wakes up a quarter to 12. The next one wakes up at seven and a half minutes to 12, blah, blah, blah. So there's no final one waking up, but there is a first one waking up mm -hmm. right? the in the second scenario, kind of reversed Grim Reaper scenario. There's no like paradox because the guy who wakes up at half 11 kills Fred straight away. All the others wake up, see Fred's dead and go back to sleep again. All good. Um, and that's like um, the, the purpose of this is, well, it's a nearby possibility. It's really close to the first scenario, which we agree is impossible. And its proximity is the thing that's pulling you in that direction because you're saying, well, look, if I think the second one's possible, it's sheer proximity to the first one makes it implausible to suppose that the the first one is impossible. If I could just right. add here, it's not just the proximity. It's the proximity together with this sort of apparent modal independence of the clocks, especially if they're all randomized. So imagine they're all randomized. And the scenario you, you just described is a scenario that just happened because of the randomized clocks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then we go to a nearby scenario where the randomization just gets sure. set yeah, differently. Yeah. Okay. And the idea is that the difference in clocks are difference in like intrinsic properties of the Grim Reapers. And these intrinsic differences seem to be modally uh, independent. It's sort of like if, if I have a blue box, uh, I could take another box and paint it red and it's not going to force the blue box to be, you know, a different color. Similarly, if the clock is set at 3.30, I could reset a clock over here and it's not going to change this guy's clock. They're yeah. just modally independent. That's, I think that's the intuition. Yes. I, okay, sure. So, yeah. So, we go sort of three things. Then the first one is just to say um, that the, like, I could 
take a chunk of bridge number one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, you know, a couple of bricks out of each one and build another bridge over the river. And um, like Proust says, look with these clock examples, it's just we should take it that things can generally be manipulated, moved around, rearranged or whatever, and that that shouldn't like be um, a, a marker of where possibility turns into impossibility, right? That's um, it should be like a smooth transition if all we're doing is moving things around and rearranging them or whatever. Um, but I'm just taking bricks out of some bits of a bridge and making a new bridge out of them. So I'm I'm just rearranging stuff and moving them about. But what happens is it it's a salient difference that moving around makes a difference. Actually, it turns something that's logically possible into something that's logically impossible. And that's all that I need to say about it. So that's the first thing. If you don't like that answer, I, get, I understand. But I sort of wonder why in the one case you're modal intuitions about recombination or whatever are totally firing and in the other case they're not firing like i don't know why that is for me they seem relevant but let me just uh, try and give you the other two as well yeah. so the, so that's my trying to give you a diffusing intuition pump see if it worked maybe it didn't but then i, I, I do have a comment about that but yeah please continue let's, let's see if i can remember these two uh the second one i wanted to say something like um well, my screen has locked let me try and unlock it quickly so God damn it. I can never type my password in properly first time. Like it just, I, mean, I just want to say I'm, okay. I'm open to what you're saying. I mean, it, it's something that I'm 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 really puzzling over that because I mean, in, in the case uh, and I don't want to, you know, as soon as you're ready, just get into those next yeah, yeah. two. But but just if no, I may, just, you know, so this sort of recombination, I mean, if I had an intuition that there's a way of recombining things so I could cross those bridges, but then I have a stronger intuition that a contradiction is impossible. Then it seems like in that case, a stronger intuition is going to override mm. any kind of recombination intuition that I have. Now, I don't know that I have, I'd have to think more about that case to see, do I even have any recombination intuition in that case? But in, in the Grim Reaper scenario and in the time travel scenario, it seems different because it's not that I have a recombination principle that contradicts some principles of logic. It's rather that I have a recombination principle that together with the proposition that there could be an infinite past contradicts some principles of logic. And so that's the difference because then, then I'm going to work backwards and we say, well, those principles of logic together with the recombination intuition gives me some reason. It doesn't have to be sort of like a knockdown reason, but it just, it pulls on my mind, it gives me some reason to think, oh, okay, well, seems like the past probably can't be infinite in that okay. case. So does that let make me try and, It does. Yeah. Um, so let me give you another way of responding then to that, which is to say, like, well, um, the defender of the view that I'm advocating, that's unsatisfiable pair diagnosis. Um, let, let's take that Grim Reaper scenario first, where you say, look, the reversed Grim Reaper scenario, they're setting their alarms, but there's one that wakes up first at half past 11 or whatever, and then the rest of them converge on 12 o'clock. Um, now, I, don't, I, I can't see any logical contradiction in that, right? It's certainly not the same logical contradiction we were talking about with the Benedetti paradoxes, right? Like, because that requires there to be no earliest member of the series. And in this case, there is. So definitely not the same paradox. Um, but for all I know, maybe it's another paradox and uh, just behind the scenes on this we don't know about. I don't know. Um, there's no reason to think that there is, but I'm not committed to the view that that's even logically possible. For all I know, it's not. I'm, I'm just, it's not the same logical impossibility as with the Benedetti case, right? That's yeah. all I'm seeing clearly. Now, but really, we're not talking about, I mean, when I say it's logically impossible, that traditionally would mean that it's metaphysically impossible, right? But it just being not logically impossible uh -huh. doesn't mean that it's metaphysically possible. That's right? Right. It might, yeah. for all I know, for all I care, be metaphysically impossible anyway, even though it's not logically impossible. Yeah. So I'm not actually committed to it being metaphysically possible, the reversed scenario. Yeah, and that's a if fair point. it seems yeah. to me that if um, its proximity to um, the case that's problematic is itself uh, something to worry about, then there's two things you could do. The first one is to say, well, um, there couldn't be a beginning a series of events. But the second one is to say, I'm going to check out this um, reversed scenario too. Like maybe, maybe you've just given me a good reason to think that that reversed scenario is also impossible. It's just yeah. it's not going to be that it's logically impossible. 
there must be some other reason. So it still seems that there's two ways you can go on that. And I'm not seeing why I should, you know, go either of those two directions. Um, well, so that no, that, that, that seems right. That seems like a one step along a path, but then I'm thinking, okay, so where do you stop this um, possibility or impossibility? So, okay. Just to get explicit, go back to the clocks, right? So let's say we come mm -hmm. up with a benign scenario that doesn't have this sort of implicit contradiction, but we leave open whether it's possible or impossible. Maybe you mm -hmm. have this recombination intuition that tells you that okay. look, if yeah, yeah. if the Gre if the Re Grim Reaper scenario is is impossible, then this scenario would be impossible, and then you you just use that same kind of recombination principle to deduce that all of those scenarios, all the clock settings are going to be impossible precisely because they're generatable by an infinite causal chain. So it's the infinite causal chain that's generating the first kind of impossibility that then through recombination can lead to a scenario that we can verify independently through the law of non-contradiction is impossible. Well, um, the... So uh, another couple of points on this, and I mean, again, it seems like you could say, so this principle of recombination is just generally the thought that like, if one thing is uh, possible and some, so like the way Lewis puts it is like, if you could have something um, like an object existing um, with all its intrinsic properties, so forget like, you know, its extrinsic properties, like whether it's to the left or the right of or whatever, some other objects, but it's just intrinsic properties and like a dragon or something just like there in some space time. And, you know, a unicorn say with all its intrinsic properties in some other bit of space time, as long as those two bits of space time don't overlap with each other, um, if each of those is individually possible, there should be a third possibility, which is that those two bits of space time are kind of like copy and pasted next to each other. So there's like yeah. a third world that has both of those in. So this is kind of like expressing the plentitude of possible worlds or something. Mm -hmm. There shouldn't be a gap if you've got two things like intrinsically possible like that you should have a third which is both of them together um so that's the recombination principle and the intuition there is that like you know in lots of those cases uh yeah you do want to say that the third thing is the genuine possibility if the first two are and what you're doing it seems to me is that principle on steroids because you're saying you know if it's infinitely many of these things um then or, you know, if there's infinitely many things individually possible, we can rearrange them into a sequence where all of them, all those infinitely many things there uh, is, a, is a third thing, essentially, an infinite plus one eth thing, which is all we should also consider to be possible. Now, uh, the first, you know, let's just take a step back and kind of think whether we have reliable intuitions about that type of recombination, because for me, I'm a bit more skeptical about my abilities to reason that far away from you know normal everyday circumstances and if i'm weighing up whether or not i've managed to deduce some very ambitious metaphysical theses about the nature of space and time with an application of that principle to such a rarefied and obscure area as that or i might have made a mistake and my mm -hmm. cognitive faculties are very liable to make mistakes especially with that type of thing it seems yeah. to me epistemic humility should recommend you know, siding with my me, me probably having made a mistake there. That, that principle, you know, while I want to say, you know, sure, if there's an apple and a banana, whatever, a third possibility is both an apple and a banana. It doesn't mean that I'm so confident when it comes to the infinite case, right? So that principle of recombination, it seems to me, I mean, not only Lewis expressed that principle, he expressed it in a paper in 1983, but he expressed it again in, 1986 in his famous book the plurality of worlds but immediately caveated it by saying well of course we need to rule out you know and i had came up with some idea about you can't copy and paste things more times than there are space-time points right so if there's uh -huh. a continuum many space-time points you can't have continuum yeah. many dragons copy and pasted into the same thing anyway so he gave this like size and shape permitting caveat that goes on the top of it so no one ever really advocates that principle with no caveats on it whatsoever um, and indeed, causal finitism is a caveat because you can't recombine things, um, you know, such that there's infinitely many causal things, right? You can have, um, well, those marble things that like bump into each other, you know, do you know what I mean? Where you lift up the top one and it like, whatever, you can have like individual like uh, instances of a cause and effect, but you can't copy and paste them so that you have an infinitely long 
um, causal chain because why? Because causal finitism rules that out. So um, an application of recombination is ruled out by causal finitism. So causal finitists restrict that principle. Now, what am I saying? I'm not saying here's a restriction on the principle. It seems to me I'm just saying, well, if you combine P and Q and you find in each of them is individually possible, but their combination is logically impossible, then the combination is to blame. The combining of those two things mm -hmm. is to blame. You don't get to say one of them must be in, on its own impossible, right? Like the there could be an infinite past with no causal relations, it seems to me, at least in principle. Um, and if there were, then you, you don't have a Benedetti paradox. Um, and that's an innocent <laughs> infinite past, right? It's You're saying, well, because I, it's possible I could fill it with Grim Reapers, therefore it must be impossible. Now, just don't does doesn't follow to, for, for me i just think what you're just showing is that that combination with another possibility is something that's jointly not compossible but that doesn't mean that either of them themselves are impossible so i mean i kind of get the intuition that you're driving at and i'm not like being well at least i really hope i'm not being uncharitable to the intuition it just seems to me that there's a there is a very strong case to be made in the other direction and all of these nuances it seems to me there's a kind of counter nuance to the other side where you can sort of work reason through, well, if I've put my um, unsatisfiable pair diagnosis hat on, I can totally explain that so because like I'm on the other side of the looking glass or something. That makes sense for me that you would have that intuition, but it just doesn't like, cash out. There's a kind of counter intuition on the other side. So I yeah. Know. Um, I, I get the feeling we're... we're I know we're, we're, we're getting to the end here, on. but this, this, this is, I think, kind of a, a good moment in this sort of dialectic. And I, I want to actually just first affirm that, I mean, my goal here isn't to sort of force an intuition upon you. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was sort of stirred and energized by your paper because it sort of, it seemed like your conclusion was saying that an intuition that I have doesn't provide me any reason. I'm thinking, okay, is that true? And I'm like soul searching. I'm thinking like, does it not provide me any reason? And I thought that the point you just made now, which is also in the in the paper about how the recombination principle uh, would be restricted, and that if you don't restrict it, you can actually use it to argue for the possibility of an infinite past by repasting mm -hmm. things from different possible worlds. That that I thought was the most interesting for me point. Um, I thought that was kind of the best. Well, I, th that was the one that I brought my wife over. It's like, Rachel, I want to like talk with you about this. And we were like talking and thinking things through. And last night I was thinking, okay, is there a recombination principle at work in the Re Grim Reaper paradox that mm -hmm. can generate the paradox that doesn't also generalize to generate the possibility of an infinite past? And it seems to me, and this is why I think your paper does advance the dialectic because you're talking about Lewis's recombination principle, which talks about taking individually possible things and then pasting them together in a new possible world. And I was thinking, okay, this is precisely the difference between the recombination principle that seems to be at work in my own intuition and this more general Lewisian principle. So let me just draw this out a little bit more. Go back to the clocks. Imagine a possible world where there's an infinite past that generates all of these clocks and they're randomly set, okay? And there's no contradiction in this scenario. So this is a place where they're all jointly possible. It's not that they're individually possible. There's a single possible world where all these mm -hmm. clocks exist. And then by this principle of modal independence, the idea is that you can fix any of the clocks, they can be changed and you can go to an adjacent possible world where some of the other clocks are changed without affecting the ones that are fixed, okay? This is going from one possible world where they're jointly possible to another adjacent possible world. And it seems to me that that's kind of like a, a move in slight differences. And you can repeat this slight difference move to generate all these possibilities. Mm -hmm. But to go from all these individually impossible world, uh, all these individually possible uh, worlds to get an infinite world it seems like that's going to be not just a slight difference, but an infinite, an infinite leap. Um, and that's the kind of recombination that the Grim Reaper paradox sort of gives me reason to think isn't possible. <laughs> that's well, not but, possible to, to recombine these things. 
So you're not talking about, it seems to me what you're saying is a sort of finitary recombination principle should be licensed, but an infinitary recombination principle shouldn't be. It's not actually that. It's about going from a possible world to an adjacent possible world versus the principle that does damage to this Grim Reaper argument would be one that goes from an infinite array of individually possible worlds mm -hmm. and takes items from all of those to produce another possible world. And that seems like it's just categorically different. Okay. I don't have I any see. intuition that you can do, you can take those infinite things and recombine them into one thing. Mm -hmm. It doesn't right, damage right, right. my intuition that the clocks in one world could be rearranged to an adjacent world, if that makes sense. Now your paper yeah, okay. doesn't address this because this recombination principle I'm describing is not Lewis's, it's a different one. Interesting, yeah, right. And uh, no doubt you'd be able to spell, and then that would be an interesting way to, to reframe it. Um, and I guess then the question would just be what reason there is to think that that recombination principle intuition. Was, was good. Yeah. <laughs> intuition. But then you can be skeptical of that. You can say, well, these intuitions are about deep things, wild things. And um, you might not have so, the intuition or you might think it has costs. One of the, and I, I guess I, we can sort of just sort of call this part to an end, if you like. But one of the broader points that I'm keen to make about this is that um, this is relationship between like logic and intuition mm -hmm. and the what's going on here to some extent is trying to like see sometimes where like prior says that logic teaches us sometimes um, where our intuition um, th thinks something is possible logic teaches us that actually it's impossible yeah. and I think it's like his example is that he's in office number seven he doesn't realize it. He thinks he's in office number eight. Um, and he thinks anyone, he thinks that, that it's always filled with idiots in office number seven. And um, he thinks to himself, um, no one in office number seven ever thinks anything true. And that you know, generates this kind of paradox, right? So for, for, for any yeah. kind of liar paradox thing as a yeah. result of that. Um, but he takes this weird conclusion about that, which is that, I mean, it's, I don't actually agree with him about it, but I thought his analysis was interesting. I mean, he, he ends up thinking that, that person actually doesn't think anything like that's the what, what we should say there because um there's just you know, to avoid the paradox you just have to like a, a conclude that he doesn't think anything which i think is wrong but I, the way he described that was you know you have this very strong intuition yeah what's going on there it does seem like he's thinking something it's just that you can't ever cash out what it is that he's thinking because it's contradictory um uh, and he says, well, look, logic just teaches us in this case, even though I feel very strongly that something is possible. Mm -hmm. Logic tells me that it's not even logically possible. And I learned something about um, the world and how it's different from the way that my intuitions tell me. And I think, you know, sometimes physics has that effect. You know, we think something's a certain way, like, I don't know, the objects are fully like occupy the space that they're in or whatever. And actually we find out that they're, they're just that's not right. Even our intuition tells us that it, that it, it is. And um, that's physics teaching us where our intuitions are wrong. And it seems to me that this is one of those cases uh, where logic teaches you where your intuitions are wrong. Um, but I mean, I don't know that. Yeah, that's kind of just a broad. Well, that, that concedes a lot, actually. I mean, if, if you're conceding that there is an intuition here, because sure, right, yeah. I mean, because if there is an intuition and that intuition provides some reason, and so I, I sort of think of logic itself as based on intuition. So I do think that one set of intuitions that are maybe clearer can curb other intuitions that are maybe less clear if there's mm -hmm. a contradiction, right? Yeah. Um, but right, I mean, but then my thought is, well, I mean, there doesn't have to be a con contradiction. We can just get rid of causal inf infinitism mm -hmm. and then you can have both. You can have the intuition behind the logic and the intuition behind certain recombination principles as a possibility. Okay. That's a nice place to end for this bit. Anyway, if we want to move on to okay. problem of evil. Yeah, sure. And um, I know, uh, as we said before, you had a conversation with uh, Dr. Michael Brown, and Dr. Ron Rouser on this. So um, yeah, I know this is obviously more conversational than debate format. So I'll leave it up to you if you want to share a screen or just kind of give your thoughts on, on the topic and then we can just, you know, discuss it as it develops. Um, okay, so I, I haven't got my slide uh, on me or whatever, but there was only one and yeah, it's no a worries. very simple argument anyway. Yeah. Um, well, I was 
presenting a modest um, evidential argument, which is really just a bit like the um, a bit like um, the fine tuning argument, right? Where the fine tuning argument says like um, the probability that there'd be a life permitting universe on the hypothesis of naturalism is really, really low. Whereas the probability that there'd be a life permitting universe and the probability of theism is like not really, really, really low. And that just means by definition that the evidence that there is a life permitting universe favors theism over naturalism. And my argument is really just the opposite of that in the sense that um, there being um, uh, unnecessary sufferings um is not really really low on um let's say naturalism or in the draperian sense of hy hypothesis of indifference which doesn't necessarily need to be naturalism as such but it's just the idea that there is no mind which created the universe or something which maybe that's all that naturalism means um but naturalism means so many things to different people let's just stick to indifference for the time being so on that indifference hypothesis, where no, there's no mind in charge of, of stuff, um, random sufferings and cruelties and things like that are not surprising. At least they're not very surprising. Um, they're the kind of the sort of thing you'd expect to see. Whereas um, if there's a perfectly good, all-knowing, all-loving God, as everyone's familiar with, um, the probability, while not zero, let's say, um, because that would be to say that it kind of logically entails there couldn't be any suffering. I'm not making that argument. All I'm saying really is surely it's less it's less uh, expected, right? It's more unexpected. Um, you'd expect an all-knowing, all-powerful, um, all-loving God to avoid us unnecessarily suffering. Um, so that provides some reason to think that it's unexpected. And it just seems to follow in exactly the same structure as the fine tuning argument mm -hmm. um, that you should favor the evidence favors the indifference hypothesis. So in this just very simple, modest sense, um, you could be looking at lots of different things to build your case for or against theism. And you might have an overriding conclusive ontological argument that means it's definitely true that theism, uh, that God exists or whatever. Um, and that's fine. It's just that um, if all you're looking at is evil and how that interrelates with your expectations, uh, you should conclude that there's some evidence in, in favor of indifference over theism in this case. Um, that seems to me what I want to say about that. So over to you. Yeah, so I was thinking about how these two topics bridge together. Uh, I don't know, uh -huh. I, I like the sort of kind of unity and, and one of the reasons I was thinking maybe it would work to discuss both of these together is I was suspecting there might be some meta principles, maybe some meta tools for thinking about these things that we'll see sort of show up in both cases. And one of them, and we'll see if this if this is true, but um, you know, you mentioned unnecessary evils or unnecessary suffering. Mm -hmm. I take this to be suffering such that there is no good reason that a supreme being would have for allowing it, right? And so it's this sort of no good reason is something that maybe is sort of hidden behind the dark of like what good reasons might there be are we in a position to see that there are no good reasons so we, we can talk about that but i was thinking about the bridge between the grim reaper and thinking about the problem of evil is that sometimes what will happen is people will have sort of maybe different intuitions and then you can take your intuition and sort of use it as a light to tease out implications where the light sort of leads to more light but then if somebody says, oh, wait, your light is shining into my dark cave where I think we don't have knowledge over here. And since I don't think we have knowledge over here, and if your intuition would say that we do have knowledge over here, uh, then I'm going to go in the other direction and sort of, it's almost like the skepticism kind of leads back and infects the intuition. And so here's, so in the Grim Reaper scenario, it's like, okay, is there this recombination principle that leads to a traumatic conclusion? And the argument from evil, the way that you set it up is like, well, okay, is there um, an intuition that if God were to be real, then God would have good reasons for suffering? Is there that intuition? Now, if there is that intuition, then it seems to me that I would need to hear a little bit more to see how the existence of suffering just by itself 
would be evidence for there being no good reason for that suffering, right? Because I can think about the hypothesis of indifference and then I can think, okay, well, maybe on indifference, uh, that gives a certain probability that there would be suffering. I can think about the hypothesis that there's a supreme being. Maybe on that hypothesis, there's a certain probability that there's suffering. Um, but if the data in question is that there's unnecessary suffering, well, then I, I think I, I want to hear a little bit more, you know, what would be the evidence that it's it's unjustified? Well, okay, yeah. so I think, um, I mean, on a really basic level, there's the intuition that if there were an all-powerful agent uh, who is all-loving and all-knowing, um, is would lower your expectation that there'd be certain types of suffering is quite mm. straightforward. I mean, it's just the case of like, if you were, I mean, if you were to see a case of unnecessary suffering, that's seen you know, a child on fire or something, and you know, there's a fire extinguisher right, right next to them, and you just don't do anything, so you're able and knowing, yeah. then not doing it basically just means that that's an immoral thing, right? So if it's just very hard to see how allowing certain types of suffering is compatible with all three of those properties, right? I mean, it's very, very well rehearsed type of um, argument, right, throughout the history of philosophy in general. So yeah. that type of thing, it gives you the, the reason to expect that type of theistic hypothesis to not have suffering. Now, you might say, well, you know, people say things like, look, um, you know, I, I let my kid get um, inoculated against the disease or whatever, even though the needle going into their arm uh, hurts them and they don't like it because it's better that, that they do that than get a disease. Um, mm -hmm. So some amount of suffering is allowed if it like leads to greater, the term is like compensatory goods that like overcome the badness of the thing. So you might allow some amount of evil if it was to be compensated for, and um, which is fine. So I, mean, I don't know if you're presenting something like that, but it seems to me that it's not difficult to find cases of suffering. So for instance, take gratuitous things that happened in the past. Like, I mean, it's such a cliche to reach for it, but you know, Nazi war crimes or whatever, killing people in concentration camps. Now, just very difficult, it seems to me. I mean, though logically possible, quite conceived that it's logically possible, but it's difficult to imagine how um, there's some good that is obtained by exactly that many people going through exactly that much suffering. Um, but that's the, you could tell a story about that, but which story is more likely, right? The story where like it had to be exactly like that, or the story where, you know, <laughs> no one was in charge overall, the kind of cosmic sense, and that's just people doing bad stuff with nobody in an uh, overall charge of them but in the thesis of hypo uh, the indifference hypothesis seems to give a much more plausible explanation of that look you can cook up a story no doubt but is that story itself going to be um it seems to me the overall complexity of of your hypothesis is going to go up um once you start saying well look maybe god had this like special super specific plan and you know, the only and maybe also only way of doing that involves, you know, like perfectly innocent, like children being horrifically killed. Um, I'm, I'm, that massively uh, increases the improbability of your hypothesis there. And I'm just somehow I think what might happen is um, piling on these specific claims to bring out a story that actually makes sense um, piles on so much improbability that it doesn't actually help you even though it's explaining the thing what you're left with is something that's um, just as unlikely as your original hypothesis it didn't have any of those super specific auxiliary assumptions built into it so yeah i mean I, yeah what so what, how does that sound to you as a as a way to come back yeah no i mean i think that's that's wonderful i mean in fact it actually brings me right back to this principle i wanted to call it the flashlight principle where if you have some theory then you can sort of think of it as a flashlight that sort of reveals implications of that theory. And, you know, it's an interesting question how to think about the prior probability of a theory. Um, I mean, so take any theory, take any theory, um, I exist. Okay, that's a theory. 
that theory <laughs> entails infinitely many other propositions. It entails the proposition that I exist is true, for example. Now, maybe that's not a very substantive implication, um, but I don't know that merely teasing out the implications of a theory would sort of in and of itself reduce the prior probability of that theory. I do think that if we add to the theory other hypotheses, that will lower the prior probability. Yeah. And so I think that, you know, I liked what you said about maybe there's some possible story that could account for certain evils. And maybe it includes reasons that we don't even know. Maybe it includes reasons that are based on experiences that we haven't had yet. And then now the question is, well, is that story baked in to the theistic hypothesis? Uh, we add it to the, hypo uh, to the hypothesis. So you've got theism plus the story. Well, mm -hmm. then it seems like that total theory would have a lower prior probability. I think that's absolutely right. But what if instead it's that theism, if it were true, would be like a flashlight that would, re would, if true, entail that there's some story that accounts for the evil, inclu including for reasons that we may not know. And if it's more like that second case, then I'm not sure that the prior probability is really harmed in that case. I mean, so here, here's another way of thinking about it. Maybe you can help me think about this in terms of the indifference hypothesis. I was thinking that suffering isn't predicted by the indifference hypothesis. So a version of the indifference hypothesis would be fundamental reality is mindless. It maybe is composed of particles or fields, has no sort of reason embedded within it to evolve, to produce any conscious beings capable of suffering, capable of wondering about the problem of evil, capable of having a conversation like this. So that indifference by itself doesn't really give any positive probability that there is suffering. But now we can maybe add to the indifference hypothesis some auxiliary hypotheses, like maybe we add to it um, that there are beings like us who are capable of being conscious. Well, now, so the question is, does that additional hypothesis follow from the indifference hypothesis in the way that you might argue that the story uh, hypothesis, that there's some story involving good reasons for evil, follows from theism, a supreme being theism, or is the auxiliary hypothesis in the case of the indifference that there are conscious beings, is that in addition to the indifference hypothesis? And I could be wrong about this, but like right here, just sitting, just thinking about it, it seems to me that the auxiliary hypothesis on the indifference case is an addition that lowers the total prior probability of that theory. Whereas the auxiliary hypothesis on the theism case where you add something that seems to follow from theism doesn't seem to be an addition that lowers the prior probability, but rather just what, just precisely what you would expect. In fact, you might even think the problem of evil is a device for teasing out the implications of theism. Uh, it helps us to mm -hmm. see, oh, okay, well, this, this would be a world in which everything works out for a greater good if God exists. Like, I don't believe that God exists, but if God did exist, then there's hope in all things. All suffering is temporary and is used for greater goods, even if I don't see what they are. Like, unless I have some independent reason to think that that isn't true, then I don't really, I'm, I'm not really seeing how that would be lowering the prior probability of theism, it seems to me. So those okay, are some so, of my thoughts, yeah. So I, th I do think it's an interesting, like, uh, response to wonder what's really predicted by the bare hypothesis of indifference mm -hmm. and i'm sympathetic to the idea that really not very much is predicted by it because it's so bare that it doesn't really say anything um so you know for instance if suffering requires consciousness which seems plausible is consciousness actually predicted on indifference mm -hmm. and if it's so unlikely on indifference um it might be more unlikely that there's consciousness at all than that God would allow suffering on theism, in which case, you know, it, it would turn the tables completely. So I understand that. And, and it's one thing to say, well, look, evolution uh, provides for selection effects on um, things feeling pain because it provides a survival advantage to them or something. So you could sort of start saying, well, here's a story that explains why there is suffering on naturalism. Um, and 
yeah yeah i understand the idea that you're you could say well look is that the bare hypothesis of naturalism or is that an auxiliary um hypothesis that's been added in and if so um doesn't that count against its kind of intrinsic prior probability beforehand mm. um in the same way that i was criticizing those sort of theodicies to suffering and it might make the overall probability low as a result of doing that um i suppose one thought is that at least on the naturalism hypothesis it does seem to me that those you don't really need to appeal to very much beyond very well confirmed scientific um theories like evolution isn't the same as saying maybe god has a plan for that little girl in the gas chamber i mean that that's not a well supported scientific hypothesis by any means it's a speculation whereas maybe um you know living creatures tend to feel pain as a survival advantage to seem to me very well supported empirically so there's sort of some difference between them but i'm not quite sure how um if we were to talk just about that point for 45 minutes i'm not sure where it would go it doesn't seem to i'm not sure about that it just seems to me there's an there's a starting point um but just to push back a little bit if you just take one of those cases where i mean so what exactly is it that you're saying i think if you think that everything plays out in the end um I mean, one way of looking at that is that there really isn't any suffering because um, any evil is kind of more compensated by uh, the good that comes along with it, that it kind of dwarfs it. And there's, you know, it's like talking about pinpricks instead of diseases or something. And that doesn't seem to really, I mean, unless what you're talking about is the compensatory good is this kind of like infinite something. I mean, even then I'm I'm struggling to see how it morally justifies it right like if i was to torture a little child to death um i think it would still be immoral even if um well i mean if if there's really some like I agree with that. good uh there's some massively good gain that comes out of it that couldn't be gained unless i tortured that little child it would to still death. be immoral I mean, still be not the way things should be right right and to say that to, to sort of bite the bullet there and say well if it was good enough maybe that would make it that that's a kind of um indecent ledger right where you're tallying up pains and pleasures and seeing whether it you won't know, there's a certain amount of pleasure that or whatever benefit that that outweighs that there's a certain point where like it's just wrong to, to even countenance those types of um evaluations right there's um so it's utilitarianism on stilts then um there's certain things that that are, that are wrong to do but it's difficult to see how you can explain, you know, allowing holocausts and stuff to happen um, unless you're making precisely that type of violation of the indecent ledger. I mean, ha what sort of, what cons what lessons did we learn? Or what compensatory goods or are there or whatever that, that you think plausibly um, uh, make it morally permissible uh, to allow, you know, millions of children to sort of starve to death all the time, that, that type of thing. Like, I'm just sort of wondering what you think that, that is yeah well i mean first i, I want to just affirm i'm not suggesting that there can be no evidence from evil or suffering from particular types of evil and suffering that weighs in the balance i'm also not suggesting that i'm in a position to mm. say in every case what the reasons are um i mean there are various theodicies that in a longer conversation we could maybe explore some of those but um but I'm not really sort of confident in my ability to weigh the probabilities of any particular story or any particular account. Um, I do think, you know, I, I think it is relevant to think about what our background knowledge is in this um, discussion, because you mentioned that we have sort of good scientific evidence for a kind of evolutionary story of the existence of beings as we are, Okay, sure. I mean, we also have good, even direct evidence that there are beings like us. So that's also part of our, we don't even need science to give us the knowledge that there are conscious beings. And so, yeah, for sure, when we're thinking about the problem of evil, we're going to want to consider, okay, which things are part of the background knowledge. And then once you fix that background knowledge, now we can consider sort of evil, the evidence of evil 
um, as sort of additional evidence. But I think the thing that's difficult for me about this is that background knowledge is part of the probability calculation with respect to how probable e uh, suffering is on theism versus non-theism. I mm -hmm. do think that, okay, so let, let me try this. I, I shared an email, a little analogy of a marriage certificate. I think kind of helps illustrate the dialectic because mm -hmm. I feel like my goal is if, if we can kind of clarify together, just kind of what's at stake and kind of these tools for thinking about it, I think that will be more empowering to the audience than if I sort of marshal one side or another side. But so here's a little story that kind of illustrates, I think, something that's at stake, which is, um, so my wife and I, we, we got married. And if you doubt that, I do have some evidence of that. One <laughs> thing that I could show you is our marriage certificate. Now, somebody could look at that marriage certificate and they could point out, they could, they could point to some places in that certificate where there are blank spaces, like between the words. And they might point out that, look, these blank spaces aren't predicted on the marriage hypothesis, but on a sort of indifference or non-marriage hypothesis that there's blank spaces here, that's exactly what we'd expect because we'd expect this whole certificate to be blank. And its whole blankness would imply its blankness here and there. That's true, That that is true. Those blank spaces represent uh, lack of knowing God's reasons for evil. So it does seem like it's true that if indifference is true, there's like a hundred percent probability that um, nobody will know God's reasons for evil. Okay. Uh, right. Because there aren't any, right. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, it seems like if theism is true, then the probability that there are reasons for evil that I don't know is also actually very high. Just as if I am married to my wife, Rachel, the probability that there are blank spaces in the marriage certificate between the words is very high. And this is where I can even tell a story. I can say, look, it's probable that, that letters aren't gonna be all shoved together. It's actually probable that there's gonna be some spaces between them. Mm -hmm. Similarly, it's probable that I'm not gonna know all God's reasons at every moment of my life. In fact, as I get older and have had my own children, I've discovered all sorts of reasons for allowing them to play in certain ways where I know there's a certain risk. Now, of course, there's limits to that, um, but there are considerations that I hadn't even considered before that can allow for certain amounts of suffering for certain finite episodes, especially if I'm in a position to know how to turn all those things into a greater good. And yeah, my kids wouldn't know my position. That's what I would expect, right? Like I would expect if there's an infinite mind, there's going to be some blank spots in our mind. I would mm. expect that if my wife and I have a marriage certificate, there's going to be some blank, some blanks between the words. And so it's hard for me to, to think of that as like very powerful evidence against theism, though I can see how it can be evidence against theism to weigh in the balance. It's just, yeah, I guess I'm not sure what else to say. It's just, there's a lot of different principles here. And I think it's important to sort of clarify, okay, well, what's your background knowledge? Is that background knowledge more likely on theism or on indifference? I mean, so there's a way in which well, we could just add to our background knowledge things that are maybe more likely on theism consciousness or whatever an evolution that produces reflective beings you might think is is not unlikely on theism uh, we could compare that on the indifference hypothesis um, then you can maybe generate some evidence for indifference if you put those things into your background knowledge but it's almost like you're sliding the scales you're shifting some of the evidence that would be for theism sort of into our background knowledge and that's fair. It's fair. You can do that. But then I just want to get the bigger picture back into play because it's all relevant. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I don't think I have a picturesque analogy. Um, and I was, I don't think this really works, but you know, may, maybe just for the sake of it, I don't have a better one off the top of my head, but rather than it being a marriage certificate where it has, I mean, because in your example, it has spaces where you'd expect there to be spaces on the hypothesis that it's mar a marriage certificate, right? Well, not, not exactly. I mean, I, I have no idea where to expect the spaces to be. Well, I but, don't know what words they're going to use. I don't know where those spaces are going to be. I just think there would be some spaces somewhere. Some spaces, yeah. And it's yeah. got like that type of spaces. And right. I think to, to try and, and as I said, I'm not 
I'm pleased with this analogy, but you know, it's something like um, the, it's not just that there are spaces on there, but like the names have been missed off, or like the certificate number or whatever the thing that like you'd expect to be there is that's missing, and that that makes you start to doubt whether this um, was just a freak, you know, le the thing of machine printed off by accident and not actually a proper certificate, something like that, where like yeah. you were expecting to see it and it wasn't there rather That's than right. just some spaces uh, where blah, blah, blah. I mean, I understand the analogy. I think it's quite a nice analogy, but. Um, and, that, that, and that's a good point that that carries over very nicely. I mean, there are cases of evil where you might think, you know what, if God really existed, he wouldn't allow that. Yeah. And I think right. if and you then, have that intuition, I think that intuition does support that, that weighs uh, in your mind as evidence, I think. So you were saying, well, I mean, there might be uh, reasons God would have that I wouldn't know or something. And that, that all sounds pretty, you know, reasonable as well, right? I mean, like, sure, he might have reasons that we wouldn't know. And it's, it does seem like a maybe okay to expect that you wouldn't have all the answers or something, a mere finite being. No, clever though you undoubtedly are, surely there would be reasons that God might have um, which would escape your ability to think about them. Sure, absolutely, fair enough. But all I, I don't think I was requiring you to be able to say that, right? So it's not so much like you need if a universal quantification. You need to have all of the answers, and any anything you can't explain means I win. It's more like um, there are just cases where I do take myself to have moral knowledge, and when I brought up one of them with you a moment ago, you sort of enthusiastically agreed. Oh no, that would be wrong, right? It doesn't matter what the compensatory yeah. goods would be, right? Torturing a child to death. And so it's just not one of those cases where we take ourselves to be lacking in the relevant knowledge about that case. I mean, you could be a complete moral skeptic or, you know, error theorist or whatever, but we're not taking ourselves along that. So it just seems like we have a shared understanding about that, that yeah. we take ourselves to have moral knowledge, at least in those types of like obvious cases. And so how come then there are loads of cases that look just like that? Right. I mean, it's it's and it's not going to be cashed out by saying, um, well, maybe there was some good that God couldn't get unless he tortured a child to death, because that wouldn't be morally right, even if that were the case. He just if God were the one that. torturing the child well, or you would allow someone to torture somebody to death. Right? So, yeah, to you and you allowed it. That's also morally wrong. Right. So um, it just seems to me like that's that is analogous to what's happening. So I that, that leads you to a you know, stronger sort of inconsistency than just spaces on the marriage certificate. That's, I don't, yeah, that was my, that was my. Yeah, favorite. no, I really appreciate that. So um, first, I just want to affirm that I actually think the best version of the problem of evil is what um, some people have called a common sense version of the evil problem, where you just find yourself seeing that something should have been prevented, like that should not have happened, and if God were real, He would have prevented it. Mm -hmm. And if you have that intuition. Uh, you know, it, you might try to argue for that based on some kind of, you know, philosophical argument about how if God had a reason, I would probably know what it was in this case or whatever. But actually, the intuition may be stronger than any argument you would give for that. And I mm -hmm. think that that can pump uh, a reasonable justification there. So that, that's the first. I just want to affirm that. But the second thing I think is really important to make a distinction between seeing somebody do something wrong. So somebody like killing somebody versus um, the situation where somebody who's sort of outside the arena or who created the arena allows people in that arena to interact, maybe in pre-assigned ways. So it's, it's interesting to me, Alex, I've watched a lot of near-death experience reports where people would have this experience of asking this being of love and light, kind of why, why evil? Why is there suffering? You know? And, and it's interesting to see the kinds of consistent answers that many different people from different cultures, different religions would get, which comes down to these purposes in love, where it's like there's this knowledge that if you come into the earth scene, there's going to be risk, there's going to be adventure, there's going to be opportunity to grow and to learn and discover. And each of those points of risk and opportunity are points for a unique and special type of love, where you love people in the face of uncertainty or in the face of risk and that terrible things can go wrong. And it's known that there are great risks, right? But that the thought here is that there's a difference between the immorality of me killing a child and the immorality uh, of 
let's say a being voluntarily coming into a state of limitation or into a adventure where there's risks for the sake of lessons in love, knowing that one of the risks are that you can be removed prematurely. Um, and that's not an answer. This isn't to say this is why there's evil and suffering. It's just to point out there's a difference between saying, oh, I shouldn't do that and saying God shouldn't allow any beings to be part of an arena. It sort of reminds me of a, a, an analogy of people playing in a basketball game and there's refs watching the game. It's like there's different roles for the players and the refs. Like imagine one of the refs is rooting for one of the teams to win, you know, well, you can't do that if you're a ref, but maybe you can't really help it. You know, you kind of root for one of the teams and the ref has the power to step in and like block a certain shot maybe or trip the player. Uh, it has the desire to do it and the power to do it. Um, but there's been an agreement by the players and the ref together. Don't do this for the sake of a greater kind of experience. Mm. And so people in near-death experiences, they talk about this idea. Uh, there's one case in particular where she said she had this experience of seeing a contract that she had signed before she was born of an agreement to come into the earth for certain purposes. And I know somebody personally who had a near-death experience and she said that she had this experience of the being of light saying, you still have purposes on the earth. So the idea that maybe there's sort of this arena of purposes where beings like us can grow and connect and interact and that the moral situation of us preventing evil is different from the moral situation of God coming in and breaking contracts that we might've made with him. Like for example, this is uh, a contract theodicy, right? Uh, I mean, who knows, right? There's all sorts of possible stories that one can tell. And again, I just don't find myself really in a position to, to see that they're improbable, um, let alone impossible. Although I mean, I'm I... very sympathetic with somebody who just has a raw intuition that, oh, that just shouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, look, on that contract theodicy, um, yeah. I think it's one thing to sign a contract about your own suffering. Um, but unless you're suggesting that people, you know, that's part of the suggestion that, that, we, that, that the contracts the contract. are agreed to by beings with God. I mean, Sturba has this book on the problem of evil, and he makes a big deal about the value of freedom and consent. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just using the flashlight principle. I, I'm just saying, okay, look, if this principle of freedom and consent is true, and if the only reason God could have, the only way God could have a good reason to allow all this kind of suffering is if there's this kind of agreement between souls and God prior to coming to the earth, then it just follows that that's probable on theism, right? And I'm not saying that all those ifs are true. I'm just saying that if somebody thinks they're true, just follow the light where it leads. Okay, if I thought that was true, I don't think I would then expect to see people uh, who would have signed contracts to have short child childhood lives starving to death because there's no opportunities to experience, you know, types of love that wouldn't have happened without, but I understand you have to risk certain things and, you know, heartache and whatever, and without that commitment and blah, 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 you can't experience well. But that doesn't, ex doesn't seem relevant to me when we're talking about some of these types of extreme suffering. So if I had that contract theodicy in mind, I would expect to see a world filled with people where they'd sign contracts such that they risked stuff, but like the payoff was worth it. Like I wouldn't sign a contract to go through a kind of virtual reality machine if they <laughs> said, you know, there's a 40% chance you're just gonna have this like really horrible life, um, but then a 60% chance you'll experience these like wondrous things or whatever. I, I, I mean, I mean, and what's the alternative to signing a contract? I mean, like, it's I, I didn't know a lot more about that. Go, what circumstances are they in? Do they really know what what other uh, situations can they go into? Before it doesn't really make sense to me unless you have a lot more. And and we're just making stuff up at this point as well. It's not. It's a possibility. It's logically possible. I understand that. It just it doesn't seem like to me that that's part of theism. This does seem like bolting something onto theism rather than it being intrinsically part of theism contract theodicy isn't part of tradition yeah, I, I would theism. only add it on if um it seemed like the ethical constraints sort of implied something like this but just just yeah. a few clarifications so i'm not suggesting that this contract theodicy would sort of explain every case of evil at all in fact mm -hmm. i was only introducing it to make a distinction between sort of moral responsibility between let's say players on the field and somebody who's governing the field that there is that distinction.
uh, it's sort of a third thought, and this is sensitive. I, I don't know if it's worth going into this too much, but um, my wife and I last August, uh, at the end of July, we lost uh, a child who was stillborn. And we're at peace and you know, we've had time to grieve. And uh, at that time, I was thinking very much about that situation. And I was also thinking a lot about this contract theory with respect to that. Um, I don't know. There, there are personal things maybe we can chat offline about that. But, uh, but one of the things that sort of plays into this is that there are ways in which even uh, somebody who comes in for a short while can forge connections with other beings through the nature of their journey. And the experience for my wife and I, I consider to be a great gift. Um, there's a kind of connection that we have with that life. And if that life is a soul that continues and it, if it voluntarily entangled itself into our journey through this short experience, there could be reasons for that that have nothing to do with sort of opportunities for it to learn the lessons of love. Um, there's just a wide range of, of possibilities here that I just don't feel like I'm in a position to, to discern the probability of. Um, that. So I get my, my point here is I'm not suggesting that the contract theory explains all the cases, but there are ways in which it can actually explain maybe a lot more than you might initially think if you start thinking about the different possible reasons for coming into agreements, coming into states of limitation. Um, yeah okay yeah so, i mean we want to what it feels like to me is that we want to have something that's like a middle ground between um like only accepting something if it's been like definitively proven to be the case and mm -hmm. just um thinking of anything that's complete wild speculation there has to be something kind of somewhere in the middle between those two where it's like you know, I want to have my mind open, but I don't want it to just be completely open to to anything. Um, I want to have, I want to feel like what we're talking about is grounded somehow. Um, and like, so well, don't you want to hold on to the idea that like, um, I don't know, if you believe if you're a theist and so something like I don't know good happens to you, don't you think that then you can connect that in some way to like, I mean, like the good intentions, shouldn't they count as evidence in favor of it being a being or whatever that's, you know, looking out for you and blah, blah, blah. But don't, I mean, if you're so open minded that you can have all of these possibilities in play all the time, um, surely it's always going to be possible that, like, actually, no, even though, like, you know, God writes his name in the clouds or my name in the clouds says hello mm -hmm. to me or something. Yeah, maybe it's not just something else or whatever. Like, if you're so open minded, then. And and you know even some intense suffering you know I mean we didn't want to talk about your own personal situation of course because it's clouds the issue but like just su the suffering of innocent yeah. people and you want to say well maybe there's some like theodicy to that is that possible to keep uh, the two things in mind I mean this is genuinely just an open question that's coming to my yeah, head but like that was the good question. you know I mean Stephen Law is this kind of like Stephen Law's question you can sort I of reverse it's quite it like way. that yeah 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 I mean my reasons for thinking that. God would be good have to do with other considerations about the nature of goodness being prior to anything else uh, that you can't sort of derive. Uh, there's a kind of asymmetry between good and bad and that good is prior to other things. So I wouldn't really argue that fundamental reality is good based on seeing like more good things than bad things. Uh, I'm actually sympathetic with the kind of, let's say reverse skeptical argument that says that, well, maybe, uh, you know, for all you know, take the evil being hypothesis, this being is setting up all these good things to produce some even greater problem down the road. And it's sort of hard to remove that. Um, no, I, I guess think, my, I think that's right. Just, I, yeah. Can I just clarify a bit then? Cause I'm not supposing there's like evil God hypothesis. Well, I'm, I'm, I suppose I'm, or indifference. well, I think it says something slightly different. I'm suggesting like when you say to yourself, well, look, something bad happened, but maybe God's got some reason for that happening. Yeah. That, like means that it's not disconfirmatory of theism. I mean, you could say when something that looks just like the sort of thing you'd expect on theism, you might say, 
gee, I guess that's, you know, I've got it right with this one. It's the sort of thing I'd expect to see that you could just say to yourself, actually, maybe I'm just getting it wrong. You know, maybe this just isn't what God did. I mean, it might be that he's, you know, that sign isn't meant for me. It's meant for some other guy. And I, I just stupidly am thinking that this is God giving me a sign or whatever, right? It's not quite I, the same as an evil God hypothesis. It's your kind of faulty ability to recognize the meaning and significance of an action in relation to God's intentions, right? I like, think that's right. I think Doesn't that it paralyzes your ability to evaluate these things. I that's, think that's that my thought. Neutral. I think I would follow that. I think I, I don't really see that as a bullet to bite. So I think I would just say, yeah, if I'm a neutral agnostic, and somebody says, hey, look in the clouds, it appears like there's a sign. I'm going to say, well, that could be coincidence. You know, I mean, that doesn't seem very compelling. If I have independent reasons to think God is real, and I see certain things that seem like, oh, that seems to fit, I might interpret it differently. Same thing if I have independent reasons wow. to think the indifference hypothesis is true, then I'm not going to expect there to be some greater good sort of squeezed out of suffering. But I mean, that's the whole question. Like, is there an independent, you know, what what are the independent reasons? I mean, that's the very thing we're trying to discern. So I, I think I, I actually take your point that as a neutral agnostic, it's going to cut both ways. And I'm going to, I'm not going to really find powerful evidence against God or for God from things that I could sort of explain it another way. It seems well, to I was thinking it's a problem for the open-minded theist, not so much for the agnostic. I mean, I take what you're saying, I think that's right for the agnostic, but if you're, you know, if you're the kind of theist who says, look, damn it, I have these expectations and um, they can be thwarted. They're just not yeah. thwarted, right? So good for me, I like that, then fair enough, right? But if you're so open-minded that, um, you know, like a kind of Freudian dream analysis where like anything really could fit with the, uh, the analysis doesn't really matter. I mean, I'm sorry if I'm not familiar with that, but you know, kind of Freudian thing was he, you come see him and keep describing, oh, I'm having this dream, and then today I had this dream, and then I, blah, blah, blah. And he can just keep stringing you along by going, oh, yeah, well, that fits the hypothesis as well, because blah, blah, blah. And like, you know, nothing yeah. can be disconfirmatory of it, right? If you're that type of theist that's like, no matter what happens, it's just a holocaust happening right outside my front door, and you go, oh, yeah, but gee, maybe there's some like reason and blah, blah, blah. And, like, nothing can be disconfirmatory. It just seems to me that like, you should really, if you're just, if you're being consistent about it, it should be that like, also when something good happens, right, that you should think to yourself, maybe th um, this isn't me getting it right. Or maybe this is um, me getting it wrong. This is something good happening to like the guy standing behind me and I don't realize. And it's just, you know, if you're so open-minded, you should be open-minded about all of those ways that you could be misunderstanding. And it's not to say that like, you can still be a theist or whatever. It's like a problem for yeah. understanding yeah. how to connect what's going on around you with God's intentions. Like that sort of straightforward, stubborn theist at the beginning just thinks he always gets it. Like uh -huh. the, the heavens either confirms or disconfirms. And he's either yeah. like, you know, back and forth. Whereas this open-minded theist just like uh, somehow it's, it's so woolly that the two things never even, the gears never connect strongly enough for it to, to do anything to their belief right it should just always kind of pass but i think i'm trying to come I up with a, an idea off the top of my head and i might not be doing it well so no it actually um i'm i'm listening i'm thinking yeah and i think that that's right and i think there's a kind of balance then uh with respect to sort of how open things are mm. and i think you you i've noticed something about you alex is you find these symmetry points <laughs> this is the is sort of the grim reaper argument you find okay a recombination principle can be symmetrically applied to get this conclusion or this other conclusion and I think that's a very helpful uh, device. And so in this case, mm -hmm. the symmetry point is that if I'm sort of kind of speculating about these possible reasons that would be consistent with the perfect being hypothesis, then that's to explain evil negative states, then same thing for positive states. So it might lead to maybe more skepticism than I want. And I, I really appreciate that. I mean, I think that's, that's really an important cautionary note. In fact, this is one of the reasons why I want to emphasize, again, I'm not suggesting that evil and suffering can't, in principle, be evidence for somebody to weigh in, in the scales against theism. Um, I think it can be. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's what makes worldview development so complicated, is that it takes sort of a mature mind to sort of weigh evidence on both sides. And it's almost easier to say, oh, there's no good arguments for that side, and there's <laughs> only good arguments for this side. You know, I win. Um, but I, I can't really say that. Um, in this context. So I take your point. I think it's a good point. Okay, so, cool. Can I ask something of you, Alex? 
Mm -hmm. um, of course. So it's kind of two points, but I kind of want to put them together. Um, and the first one kind of comes back to your criticism of, well, baking all these extra things into theism that might be more so speculation than something like evolution, which we have direct evidence for. Okay. Um, and my kind of thought is, I don't know if you can help but bake things into either hypothesis. So it's one thing to look at evolution and say, okay, we have scientific evidence for it. We know it occurred. But to me, it's different to say on indifference or atheism, I would predict evolution to occur rather than uh, the molecules or the elements to never evolve beyond hydrogen because it's more of a predictive mm -hmm. from projecting into the future. So to me, it's on indifference. I don't know that suffering is particularly likely in the sense that you would even predict all the things necessary to get to the point of uh, beings that were capable of experiencing suffering, kind of like Josh brought up. Um, and then when it comes to the theism hypothesis, I also don't know that regardless of which side you're coming from, that you can't avoid baking things into it. So, for example, to say that suffering isn't likely on theism, you kind of have to already bake into it that God is good. Because if, if it's like the Stephen Law evil God thing, then suffering is likely. So to say mm -hmm. suffering isn't likely, you're presupposing he's good. But then to presuppose he's good might also, I think, suggest or just entail that if he is going to create human beings and they're going to suffer, there's going to be a good reason for it. Um, unless you're kind of supposing the purpose is to kind of have us as pets in a terrarium and keep keep us comfortable, so to speak. So, and and then if you have something like God is good and therefore there's going to be a purpose, I don't know if if it's as much speculation as it seems to think that something like a free will theodicy or soul building theodicy is more compatible with that than the pets in a terrarium theodicy. And so to say it, they're kind of equally speculative. I don't necessarily agree. I think the free will theodicy would be more likely given a good God and a purpose for allowing suffering. And then kind of how that transfers into when you spoke of uh, per us preventing a particular evil. If we saw, say, a robbery, our gut thing would, we would try to prevent it, assuming we could. And, you know, we were capable of disarming the robber and let's say not fearing for our own safety in that uh, circumstance. And, you know, Braxton Hunter made this point that it could be that God actualizes a world in which that's always right for us to choose because we're kind of looking from this finite perspective of we don't know what goods can occur. So God can actualize a world in which that's always right for us to choose, but God having a different perspective can have reasons for allowing other things. And then I would just want to kind of slightly combine that with Trent Doherty's view, which would be that it could be that for any given individual who goes through suffering, even if we from the outside might look at that and say, that's horrible, I can't imagine any reason God would allow that, that from the individual's perspective, if a, if they had, can have eternal perspective from heaven or something, that they could look back on it and, and see it overall as good. And I think this came up when you were talking to Randall Rouser. He talked about a soldier who maybe both his legs were blown off and nevertheless could look back over his life and justify and say, yes, but given the things that have happened since then, I think my life is overall good. And your response mm -hmm. to that was to say, well, what if you gave the soldier a perspective of had his legs not been blown off and he could say, well, now I'm walking around, I'm, I'm more free to take care of myself, I'm not as dependent on others. But it seemed to me that that might not be the case. It might be the case that because of his legs being blown off, he meets a woman that he would not have met otherwise and has a family and derives great meaning from that. And that if you gave him the ability to look at his life with legs and he saw that he just lived a life of a string of one night stands, that he might say, yeah, I, I wouldn't choose that one if given the opportunity. So I, I was just wondering all your thoughts on that. Well, I mean, so you're bringing up the kind of the modality of regret, which I actually think is a really interesting topic. Um, and I mean, I don't think the way this works is that you have a branching point at some point in your life like your legs getting blown off or not getting blown off. And that from that point onwards, there's one thing that would have happened to you. So if my legs hadn't got blown off, then I would have met someone. And if they had, I wouldn't or something. Um, the reality is your life is full of branching points at, all the time. And it's actually difficult to identify anything. as a significant branching point because they can, you know, kind of butterfly effect sort of thing. It can just happen without you even realizing. So, the legs getting blown off might not have even been a significant branching point for him. Um, so the Christmas Carol kind of like 
getting shown what their life could have been like isn't isn't showing them what their life would have been like because there is no such thing as what what their life would have been like there's just a whole branching tree of possibilities from what would have happened or what could have happened if if their legs had not been blown off um so it's not like who is it i would have got married to if my legs hadn't got blown off. that doesn't make any sense there's just like billions of different versions of you panning out from that thing in the past so there's no one-to-one -one comparison um in 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 the modal space right there's um at least that's my view anyway there's just there's yeah. there's there's one pathway through that a kind of thin red line of your actual course of life and then everything else is just possibilities um but you could what i was suggesting was well, what if someone showed them what their life could have been like so they're just showing them basically an arbitrary alternative that they could have lived um and just saying isn't it true that that would have been better than this? Um, and it just seems to me mad to think that it wouldn't have been. You're just saying, well, I could pick another world where actually they're more unhappy if their legs didn't get blown off. Well, of course you could, right? There's nothing special about which one we pick. I'm just saying mm -hmm. the ghost from Christmas possibility could have shown her, uh, could, could just pick a random or uh, especially choose one of those worlds where their life goes off really well. And it would be foolish to, for them to say, yeah, but. I, unless exactly this thing happened, I wouldn't be exactly me. And that's worth more than this alternative possibility where I'm obviously much more happy the whole way through. And I wouldn't change it if you gave me the option. I mean, it, it seems to me that's insane to think that you would stick to your, even if he hadn't got his legs blown off, it's just some normal humdrum, normal person. And someone says, I'll give you like the chance to switch over to like your like super version where you kept rolling sixes throughout your whole life and everything's really amazing. Like, obviously you'd switch to that one, right? Because it's just objectively better than the one that you happen to be in, right? So you should, and that's how regret should work. It's when people cloud it with thinking about the contingent path that's led up to exactly where they are now and tell themselves that that's actually the best way things could go. And if anything has changed from that, I would actually be losing some special good that I, that I need and that I'm super lucky to have. That's quite well explained by just thinking of a kind of psychological mechanism, a coping mechanism that's very realistic that we have built into us for all sorts of things. And you know, everybody thinks they're cleverer than they actually are, luckier than they actually are, better looking than they actually are, this type of stuff. Mm. And that's useful to get through life because if we have this kind of crushing reality uh, evaluation of our mediocrity, uh, then it would be really difficult to get through. So it's a good thing that we have this unrealistic vision of how good our own particular circumstances are. But when we're doing philosophy and we want to work out what the proper modal epistemology of regret is, we shouldn't let that type of intuition get in the way of a cold, hard understanding of what the rational evaluation of, of the possibility should be, it seems to me. Yeah. Sorry, so, that was quite a long-winded way. Of I don't mean to take over for you, Josh. Um, I just, if I can say two things. So the one, just very briefly, would be even if I were to grant something like it's a coping mechanism, to me that that wouldn't affect whether or not it was real. So if you could think of marriage uh, as kind of a coping mechanism to the loneliness and disastrousness of life, that you're going to face tragedies no matter what, and you're better off going through it with somebody than without somebody. Um, but marriages are still real. There's still, I would say, objective meaning in the relationships, even if yeah, course, say, somebody's true. particularly pessimistic about it and would view it more as a coping mechanism. Um, but the second thing, you said something that I thought was key there, which was saying that the kind of, if someone could look at this hypothetical where they're rolling nothing but six, six is that that's objectively better. And I don't know that it would be objectively better. I think you could say it might be objectively preferable to the individual if he didn't have enough, say, knowledge to properly weigh the two. I don't know that it would be objectively better because when I'm saying... And I would agree with you, by the way, that there's kind of many branching points. So instead of saying showing one alternative, you could show a bunch of them because there's all these different branching things that occurred. Um, but something that occurs to me is if we're saying something like, and this is why I prefaced it by talking about a good God and having a purpose. If you say something like, well, given the kind of universe God chose to create with the, with the um, purposes he has in mind, then given if you look at a particular branching point, there's not going to be infinitely many possibilities like all rolling sixes or having everything you could possibly want. 
given the laws of physics that God has created, given the parameters that are in the universe, there might be only certain realistic things that occur, um, especially if, if his goal is just for the people, person to freely enjoy fellowship with him forever, as opposed to if you just show every individual this alternative where they everything's perfect, nothing bad happens to them, and, and they can have all the things they want. Well, if you show that to every individual, then every individual would have to have his own little universe. And in my opinion, that would be kind of a shallow way to live if someone didn't go through certain suffering and character development. So I, I don't know if that makes sense. Well, if, if, if I may uh, respond, mm -hmm. so it can, can, is God able to uh, enjoy an abundant life without suffering? And if God can do it, why not create other beings more like himself who can just enjoy an abundant life without suffering. Is this what you're going to say, Alex? No, that's good though. It's probably better than what I was going to say. Okay. <laughs> well, just a question. Um, well, actually, can I uh, append another thought to that, which is, um, you know, if, if you say, well, uh, a certain amount of suffering is required, right? Because you can't have everybody living a really good life. Because as you say, how, how, does, how does it combine with everyone everyone gets what they want, then it's very difficult to see everybody getting what they want, making sense altogether. So if someone has to not get what they want, but then it just seems very unfair on that, those people who don't get to get what they want. Um, so then I go back to, you know, think of the child in the starving to death or whatever, it's too bad for them, I guess, you know, someone has to be the person who's losing out on that just so that everyone else can maximize their own experiences. You know, so God's got some ratio and uh, you're the one who has been having to just starve to death for seven years, and that's all you get. It just seems to me that's incredibly callous, and and it's not the sort of thing that uh, we should see happening, right? Even on that theory, where um, I agree, you can't be everybody getting what they want all the time, but you're still stuck having to explain how there's these people out there who um, suffer in, in that way, right? With so even in in addition to what Josh just said, which seemed to be a very cogent point. Um, I'm wondering. Well, I have a response to what I said, though. I mean, okay. yeah, it's <laughs> I, be too I, strong. Yeah, I, I don't want to, because you guys are the brilliant minds here. I don't want to say too much more. So I'll just say this. Um, that's why my point was, if if retrospectively one could look back on the whole and say and, and feel justified in the life they lived, right? And so even for some people who that seems suffering, it's not as though only some people look back. Only very few people look back and say, okay, I, I count it all as, as, as worth it, even the bad stuff. I'm saying, is it possible that's the case for everybody, even people who live very short lives? And let's say, if, if it's true, I know this might be something too extra to bake into, but if it's true, for example, that children go to heaven because they weren't mature enough to make the conscious choice to choose heaven or not heaven, that it could be that even if it, they die young, it could be that had they lived, it would have just been immensely even more suffering than just the, the the finite suffering and now their 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 existence is in heaven and they feel justified in that and then just real quick to josh's point um i i don't think it's possible that god could create beings exactly like himself mm -hmm. right because i because by definition if he created them they'd have to be contingent and so if he's necessary so they have to be contingent in some way if, if they're being created. So he can't create beings exactly like himself. Now, I do think he could create beings closer to himself, like the angels. Uh, and again, this is talking Christian theology now. Satan rebelled, so even that existence isn't a perfect one um, if he creates angels more like himself. And it does seem that they're at least more shallow uh, in that they don't go through the same character building we do. And so I think that, yes, there's more risk for evil for more finite creatures like us, but I do think it might be more worth it in the end. Well, I'm not sure whose turn it is to speak now because it's three of <laughs> I guess it's you, Josh. <laughs> yeah, and I, I was just gonna add kind of a little bit in response to my own point as well, that uh, I do think there are all sorts of goods uh, that would be missing without a world in which beings can have growth, relationship, discovery, progress, and adventures within context of risk, delegated responsibilities, where uh, God doesn't accomplish all the goods, but rather delegates the responsibility to other sovereign beings to explore and discover and to forge a path forward collectively and individually. And so there's many, many goods that I think would be missing in that scenario. And I think there's a useful distinction here between 
being sort of the maximum in greatness with respect to a being versus being the maximum in greatness with respect to a total world. And so you can have a being that is the maximal in greatness with respect to being that being, even if there are goods, uh, world good making, uh, good world making goods, how do I say this? Goods that contribute to the greatness of a world that would be missing without a diversity of beings. Um, so there's a lot on the table here, but um, I don't know what you guys want to do from here. But those are some uh, of my well, thoughts. We've past the hour and a half mark that we agreed to. Um, and I know Alex, you're obviously hours ahead of us, so I don't want to keep you up too late. So perhaps I could give you the last word if that's okay with Josh. I have just one, uh, to give Alex the, the last word, can I add one more word right now? Sure. Then Alex can respond to this. Um, it's just on the question, is suffering evidence for God? Uh, for atheism or indifference or whatever. Uh, and I just wanted to just offer a kind of summary about that, which is that I think it's going to depend, the answer to the question is going to depend on what you bake into your background knowledge and what you bake into your understanding of suffering. I think that if you leave the background knowledge open and you're just comparing theism with indifference, it seems clear to me that suffering is way, way more probable on some form of theism that would predict the the uh, resources for building an adventuresome world with suffering in it, then on indifference, which doesn't predict that there would be any resources to produce beings um, that are complex, intelligent, let alone even capable of consciousness. Uh, so I, I definitely think suffering sort of in itself is powerful evidence for theism over indifference, but if we bake in background knowledge, things can change. And if we add more to suffering, like specific types of suffering, things can change. And so I do affirm that it's possible for somebody to consider some suffering and say, you know what, I wouldn't expect God to allow this if God were real. This doesn't seem so unlikely given my background knowledge together with the indifference hypothesis. And so this points towards indifference. Um, so that's my conclusion. On that. Okay, so I think um, so. There's this point made by Paul Draper, which is that like um, sometimes when you examine a piece of evidence and consider whether it's evidence in favor of a hypothesis or not, what helps is considering the wider context for that. So, for instance, it's quite plausible to think to yourself, well, um, what's more likely? um that consciousness would arise um on theism or that consciousness would arise on indifference or naturalism or whatever and it just seems like well quite clear that it's more likely on theism than on naturalism so it seems like lucky or something if it would arise on naturalism whereas it sort of was understandable well i mean you know we are baking something into his intentions of course i mean he doesn't want a world just filled with triangles and nothing else or something like but you know you can understand how if he's good maybe he'd want there to be uh, conscious entities or whatever like i i get that there's just some story it's not massively implausible um and there's no story at all on naturalism and none that i know that makes it seem um uh, predicted or whatever so you know it seems like a clear win for theism there but if you pay closer attention it starts to feel less like a clear win because the type of like why would on theism um it starts to seem a bit strange that like the type of consciousness we have is sort of precariously um, connected to like a squashy a gray bit of matter and the like certain uh, you know, changes to that can massively affect the, the soul or whatever that's going on in the background. And like, that's not the sort of thing you'd predict if it was God making conscious experiences, because wh why would you do that? It's very difficult to see why, you know, that's not required for any like moral growth or like special experiences or anything. It's difficult to see why that's there. And actually it being a weird outgrowth of some, like let's say un, at the moment unknown process that generates consciousness from matter. I mean, if that's how it worked, it would be weirdly connected to some squashy bit of gray matter. That's the sort of thing you would expect. And it's like uncomfortable contingent connection to something um physical like so it starts off looking like evidence for theism but when you zone in on like what's the actual detail of how does that work is it like we'd expect on the theistic model it starts to not look like that and it starts to look like 
just a weird accident sort of thing that might come up if things were just a bit random. So I wonder really with these, maybe it's the same point that you were making, which is that like, we have to work, be careful of what we're packing into the background. Maybe it's a question of um, being careful to attend to the wider context of the evidence as well. Maybe that's saying the same thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess I agree, I suppose, that these bits of evidence are difficult to evaluate. Um, I think my modest argument was really just uh, defining theism such that it's just really three claims, right? All good, all powerful, all knowing. Then, you know, it generates some kind of expectation, um, which is low, because it doesn't have all these additional hypotheses in about purposes in particular and like the what if this and what if that. Um, if you start off with that bare hypothesis, it just seems like relatively uncontroversial and it's not a threat to anyone's like faith or anything just to say, yeah, it's that you wouldn't expect this type of uh, suffering, but because it doesn't prevent you from saying, but I believe a whole bunch of other stuff too. And because of that, I don't actually find this sort of suffering unexpected. Um, and so the interesting bit of the argument comes after what I was proposing, it seems to me fairly uncontroversial and straightforward, which is just, you know, simply the combination of those three claims generates an expectation value and in this way and and i don't think actually that anyone's actually trying to push back on that they're just saying but it's different my actual view is different to the to what your argument was arguing against which is completely fine because it's just a doorway into having a conversation about okay well, what is your actual view how do you what do you think about that rather than um, i'm gonna bring ponage to the you know, any Christian with my undefeatable argument or whatever. It's not what's going on. It was just a, um, yeah, and a, and a conversation opening. Like um, Mike was saying, like, it's a bit like a chess opening. I'm just interested to see where it goes rather than thinking it definitely wins no matter who the opponent is, right? Anyway, I, I, I know, I know, you, I know you, you have the last word here, so I, but I just, just to give you one more word, if I could just <laughs> uh, clarify that this sort of landing point there that there's a kind of minimal theism that, uh, wouldn't give you these expectations um, that would maybe explain the evil. And I think my thought is is maybe to challenge, I think, this point that I think you were taking as sort of an uncontroversial opening move. I think maybe I am challenging that. I think what mm -hmm. I'm suggesting is that theism, that minimal theism together with sort of independently plausible, agreed upon, uh, more ethical intuitions, would be a reason to expect that on theism everything's going to work together for good there's going to be a some story even if i don't know what it is um, and that i would even expect not to know that there would be lots of blank spaces uh so i mean and, and not to say that you don't have responses to that but just to say that i think even that very opening move is is one that i might be challenging possibly i'm not sure what do you think are we, can, are we kind of seeing eye to eye on the dialectic here or, or am I missing something? Yeah, um, even my opening, even my um, pawn to d5 or whatever, the most straightforward opening move, you're saying, oh, maybe that's not a great move. Um, I mean, yeah, but I think in the interest of time, we do have to stop talking at some point. It's already <laughs> getting uh, too late for me. So um, I don't think maybe, it's maybe be it a is a great move. Maybe it is a great move, but it's just not <laughs> obvious that there's no possible defense. Maybe maybe that's of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't I don't claim yeah. to have an argument for which there's no possible defense. I don't think there are any arguments for which there are no even interesting uh, mm -hmm. ways forward. That's not what philosophy is. It's not yeah. going on YouTube and owning someone to the point that they have nothing <laughs> to say. That's not what it's about. Um, so yeah, and I'm I think we in the interest of time though, I think we have to draw the conversation to a yeah. close. If that's and, and I think that's one of the great things about the conversations you have, uh, Alex and Josh, both of you, to, uh, you know, when I watch your discussions, I feel like, you know, as an audience member watching it, like we're pursuing truth together. It's not just mm -hmm. one person trying to knock down yeah. the other. And, and that's one thing I actually agree with Alex on a ton of stuff. You know, I was turned on to you by uh, capturing Christianity's channel, Cameron Bertuzzi. And uh, then I went to your YouTube channel independently and watched a bunch of stuff. Um, so, yeah, I just I'm I'm so grateful the, to both of you for being here. Um, links to both of their YouTube channels for the audience is in the description. Please go there, subscribe, check out the material, subscribe to this channel, uh, and turn on notifications because subscriptions don't necessarily mean that you're getting um, the latest content anymore. And uh, again, until then, uh, next time, uh, thank you, Dr. Alex and Dr. Josh, for being here. I really do appreciate it, guys. Thank no you. Problem. Thanks for having me.